Well, good morning to each and every one of you. I uh, invite you to join with us now as we worship the Lord together through song. Please stand if you would and, and uh, join Stacy and I as we uh, lead worship together. Our first song is You Are My King, Amazing Love. Thank you. 
You may be seated. At this time, we'll go before the Lord in prayer, so we encourage you to bow with me now. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I thank you so much for the privilege and honor it is to be able to lift praises to you. I don't know when it was the last time that we just reflected on that, that beautiful privilege that we have to sing. In many parts of this world, and now we're seeing here in the United States, that's being tried to be muffled out, whether it be because of mandates or a growing tension towards those who are believers. One way or another, Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we have here in this country. We thank you for you being our constant. You never change. You never have changed and you never will change. And in a world that is day by day changing so much, how awesome it is to serve a God who does not change. So Lord, I pray today, whatever it is that we brought here on our hearts this morning, I pray that we lay them at the feet of the at the foot of the cross. I pray that. You will help us to unload that baggage that we may be carrying, that you tell us to give to you. Help us with the temptation that it is to pick up that baggage again and carry it with us. The temptation it is to even take a little bit of it with us. It's not easy for us, Lord, to give up control But remind us that you are sovereign, so we can trust you. We think of those here in our congregation who have been going through some difficult times. We think of those that maybe are recovering from a surgery. We ask for your healing, your blessing upon them. And as we go now and open your word, I pray you'll teach us what you want to teach us through the pages of Scripture. And so we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, because you are worthy. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to be going through an entire chapter in Daniel. Uh, so I had told you when we started off the sermon series that sometimes we would go cover an entire chapter, sometimes we'd break it up into two. Um, when we get into the latter part of Daniel, I don't know, we might be breaking it up into three because there's so much to cover there um, with um, biblical prophecy and stuff there. But um, today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. I'll start off with this. In St. Louis in 1984, an unemployed cleaning woman noticed a few bees buzzing around the attic of her home. Since there was only a few, she made no effort to deal with them. Over the summer, the bees continued to fly in and out of the attic vent, while the woman remained unconcerned, unaware of the growing city of bees. The whole attic became a hive, and the ceiling of the second floor bedroom finally caved in under the weight of hundreds of thousands of pounds of honey and hundreds and thousands of pounds of angry bees. While the woman escaped serious injury, she was unable to repair the damage of her accumulated neglect. Well, just like the woman in this illustration, we oftentimes fail to consider the gradual cumulative effect that sin can have in our lives. Similarly, in our text for today, in Daniel chapter 5, we see this gradual disregard to vessels of God. And 
things that these vessels of God were things that should have been known by everyone that they were to be held in honor but instead were ignored and brought and what brought about was God's quick judgment as a result of that. This chapter here is an interesting one because we're introduced very quickly to a man, a king, by the name of King Belshazzar. Now, that is not to be confused with Daniel's uh, Babylonian name that he was given, Belteshazzar. Okay? This is Belshazzar. And he's Nebuchadnezzar's successor. We've been talking about Nebuchadnezzar from the beginning of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar has passed on. He's out of the picture now. And who has succeeded him is this king, Belshazzar. And he's taken the throne now after Nebuchadnezzar's death. We're, as quickly as we're introduced to Belshazzar here, he exits the narrative as well because of the blatant disregard that he had towards the golden vessels that they took from the temple of God in Jerusalem and worship their own gods with it as a result. Now, we don't know much about Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, but one thing is clear. In the contrast between him and King Nebuchadnezzar, God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar, but his judgment was going to come quick and swiftly with King Belshazzar. One pastor comments on this by saying the following. He says, this is a reminder that we dare not presume upon the grace which God has shown to others. To know that God is gracious and yet not to turn from our sin in the light of that grace is to fall under his righteous judgment. Such was the experience of Belshazzar. And that's one of the awesome lessons that we can take away from this chapter here in Daniel chapter 5 that we're going to look at today. In fact, if there was one thing that we could take away from the entire book of Daniel that we've covered thus far, and what we will continue in the remainder of this book, is the fact that God is sovereign. That he is in control. For today, we're going to break down this chapter into two parts. First, we'll see the finger of God's judgment... And then we'll look at how this section of Daniel parallels with Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12 of the rich fool. So that's what we're going to do today. So let's start off by looking at the finger of God's judgment, verses 1 through 12 of Daniel chapter 5. This morning, once again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man, of a man's hand, emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles, and the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. 
and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, counters, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and insight in interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving in difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Now there's a couple of things that we see clearly within these first 12 verses. And first and foremost, the first thing that we see is that God's sovereignty is seen in both grace and in judgment. God's sovereignty is seen in both his grace and his judgment. When God's finger writes out the judgment that he was going to bring, it was done so in a way that was done in his own timing. Daniel at this point seemed to have been forgotten. He's old. He's not this young or middle-aged man anymore. He's now close to his 90s. And he's replaced most likely by wise men that would have been told that would have probably been telling King Belshazzar exactly what he wanted to hear in his short reign. We see that displayed here in verses 2 through 4 of our text by how Belshazzar obviously hadn't learned anything from Nebuchadnezzar's reign. What's important to point out about the foolishness of Belshazzar here is highlighting upon what was happening between the lines of our text. But Babylon wasn't this great power anymore. Instead, Belshazzar throws this feast in the midst of a time when the Medo-Persians were knocking on their door, ready to take over the kingdom and the empire. Now, if you'll remember back in Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this statue, and Daniel described in the statue that this head of gold, which represented Babylon, below that was the torso and the arms. And that torso and arms represented the next kingdom that was going to take over, which was Medo-Persia. Now, someone might say, well, wait a minute, time out here. So what if he threw a big party? So what if he threw this big party on the, on the verge of what looked like was going to be a takeover, from the Medo-Persians. So what? It might, have been, it might have been a way for him to try and calm people down in the midst of what was taking place around him. And that would just be wrong thinking. Because it's not the timing of the feast that is important here. What's important to point out is that behind all of this, behind the reasoning for Belshazzar throwing this feast and this big party, was for him to exalt himself in the midst of this, for him to be the center of attention. That's the first thing that we see clearly here. The second is the blatant and deliberate blasphemy against God that takes place. Look at verses 2 through 4 again. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So Belshazzar not only used these instruments from the temple, which were to be used only for the most holy of purposes in worshiping the Lord, not only does he use these instruments that he was not supposed to use, but verse 4 says that while using these, while drinking out of these, while partying with these instruments here, they practice idolatry with them while using them. Now it doesn't take long for the Lord to step in here. It doesn't take long for him to pronounce judgment through this writing on the wall. And this writing on the wall didn't appear overnight while everyone was sleeping. It didn't uh, uh, appear secretly, but visibly, 
right before the king's eyes. Can you imagine this? All of a sudden seeing this, this divine hand, all of a sudden just inscribing something out of nowhere. If you're listening, say amen. amen. If there's nothing else that you remember from this message, I want you to remember this. We as believers need to be reminded that even when it seems like the things of God, the people of God, and the church are being trampled upon, we have no need to fear. I'll say that again. As believers in Christ, we need to be reminded that when we see the things of God, the people of God, the church being trampled upon by the world, we have no need to fear. God's kingdom, God's will, God's church, the gospel, his living word can never be snuffed out. Just studying church history will show you that. From, from the early Christians that, that were burned at the stake to the enduring through the Roman Catholic Church discouraging the populace from reading the word of God on their own, from, from the burning of Bibles by power-hungry bishops to the bones of John Wycliffe, who was the one who translated the New Testament into English, from his bones being exhumed and publicly burned to ashes, and then those ashes being thrown into the river by the Archbishop of Canterbury. God's word cannot be snuffed out, even though many, many people have tried, and many, many people will try before Jesus returns. The late Billy Graham once said this about the Bible. The Bible has stood the test of time because it is divinely inspired by Almighty God and written in ink that cannot be erased by any man, religion, or belief system. Amen. 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 After God steps in here with Belshazzar, by this visual display, I want you to notice a little humor that's included here in what Belshazzar does. Look at verses 5 through 9. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and, became, and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster on the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed in purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. The king here was more, after this, this whole thing with this, all of a sudden this hand, the back of this hand he didn't see, this inscription being written out here, we see a little bit of humor here, and, and the King Belshazzar was more nervous than, than a small nun at a penguin shoot. He, he was more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. He, he was more nervous than a ceiling fan store owner with a comb over. You get the point, right? His knees were knocking so hard, he really probably wouldn't have had to page his conjurers or his wise men to come in because they would have heard the knocking and they would have come around him. So once again, we see these counselors here, they can't even do their job right. How do they still have a job? Yeah. This is the third time they've been paged that we read about. Who knows how many other times they've been paged here. This is the third time we've read about in the book of Daniel where they're paged and they can't do their job. We don't know. How this still getting? It's like, it's like a meteorologist. How can you be wrong so often and still have a job? I don't know. Anyway, that's beside the point. On the heels of 
these counselors here being of no help, Belshazzar becoming even more nervous, verses 10 through 12 tell us that finally Daniel is remembered. The queen comes in, and she recommends and remembers how this man by the name of Daniel was a huge help in the life of the previous king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what we're going to close with today, an Old Testament version of the rich fool. Look at verses 13 through 28 here. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read the inscription and make, the, make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make their interpretation known to him. O king, the mighty high God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was disposed, or deposed, excuse me, from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beasts, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is an in inscription that was written out. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Abharzim. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your, your kingdom and put it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Now, we're going to stop there. Notice here, as these verses start out, that not only does the queen, in verses 10 through 12, remember Belshazzar, but the king now is being reminded of this. Daniel tells us that, that you knew all this. You, th th this history lesson that I'm giving you here that we just read about, this isn't the first time you're hearing this. This isn't the first time that you know about me. But what's interesting here is they do not refer to Daniel in his Babylonian name. They don't call him Belteshazzar. They refer to him as Daniel. His Hebrew name. When the king has Daniel brought before him, notice how he addresses Daniel aside from his name. Looking at the second part of verse 13 to 
through 16. Are you that Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods, notice that this is what he's known for, a spirit of the gods is in you. And that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have found in you. Just now, the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make the interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. The king knew Daniel's history. That Daniel was blessed from wisdom and had this spiritual gift that was given to him from God to be able to interpret dreams. And the king refers to him as having a spirit of of the gods. He knew how instrumental Daniel was in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. But here we see that Belshazzar tries to persuade Daniel by offering him some great prizes, wealth, and a prominent position within the kingdom that's about to crumble. I love Daniel's reply to the king here in verse 17. He says, keep your gifts to yourself. Yeah. Or give them to somebody else. That that would be a, a different way of saying take your gifts and put it somewhere. Yeah. But I'm going to give you the interpretation anyway. Is what he says here. I love that. He gets right to the point though of getting right down to business. And after giving. Uh, Belshazzar here, the Reader's Digest version of Nebuchadnezzar's reign and what happened and how God brought about the repentance and the faith of the one true God. This history lesson comes to an end and we read about this divine accusation that Daniel now brings against Belshazzar himself. Look at verses 22 to 23. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. Once again, there's your answer to Daniel saying, this isn't the first time that you're hearing about this. This isn't the first time that you should have learned by the example of your father, Nebuchadnezzar. You knew all this, but you ignored it. You saw the grace of God, maybe with your own eyes. We don't know how old Belshazzar was at this point. Maybe he saw with his own eyes Nebuchadnezzar go from insanity, eating grass like a cow, to being restored and being a completely different man because now he followed the Lord. He saw all that. He knew all that. And despite all of that, he did not humble his own heart. Daniel says in verse 23, But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, wood, iron, and stone, which you do not see, or which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Now by Daniel reminding and pointing out Nebuchadnezzar's story, then accusing Belshazzar of not learning from Nebuchadnezzar's example, what we see here is that Belshazzar is without excuse. It's not like Belshazzar could say, wow, I never knew any of it. And had I known some, any of this, I certainly wouldn't have been conducting myself the way I've been conducting. He couldn't give that excuse. Belshazzar knew he wasn't humbling himself before God and all that God had done within the kingdom of Babylon there. And so because of his sin, God was going to bring him down. There was not a single excuse that Belshazzar could use to get him out of the punishment that he was going to have dealt out to him. It was too late. This reminds me of the story 
Many people, many Bible scholars say that this is not a parable. Many Bible scholars say that what I'm going to read to you now is an actual scene that Jesus describes because parables don't use names of real people in real places. What I'm going to read to you now is the story that Jesus tells of Lazarus and the rich man. Turn to Luke chapter 19. Hold your place here because we'll come back. Luke, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. Many of you might be familiar with this, but it's, it's always good to review. Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus at his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persecuted, or they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. How ironic is it for Jesus to say what he said here in verse 31 of Luke chapter 16? Because he did rise from the dead, and millions and millions and millions of people throughout the history of time have not believed. So much like the rich man in this story, what we just read, and Belshazzar in our text for today, when we hear the gospel and do not repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, we are without excuse when we die, rejecting him and standing before the judgment seat of God. That's what Revelation chapter 20 talks about. When all believers one day will stand before the judgment seat of God, this great, right, great white throne judgment, where it says that, that heaven and earth fled away from God's presence. Imagine that. And they're standing before the judgment seat of God, and all are being declared guilty because their name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And all of them, each and every one of them is without excuse because they've heard the gospel message and rejected Jesus Christ. Back in our text here, Daniel goes on to explain what this writing uh, on the wall meant exactly for Belshazzar and the Babylonian Empire. He goes on here in verses 24 through 28 and basically what he tells him is, Belshazzar, your number's up. You're finished. You and the Babylonian Empire is coming to an end. You've been weighed on God's balances, and you don't meet his standards. You've come up short, now you're gonna end, your life is going to end and your kingdom's going to end. In other words, it simply means everything around him is going to be destroyed and taken over. 
There was no more room for discussion. There was no lawyers that could have been present that could have said to Daniel, oh, well, wait, I object. There's no more second chances. All the tears in the world could not wash away the judgment that was going to come from God. What a sobering reminder this is for us today. There will come a day when Jesus will return at his second coming. And there will be no more chances for repentance and salvation for those who have rejected Jesus. Time will be up. God's judgment will be swift. And eternal punishment in hell will be a very real reality for the unbeliever. Charles Spurgeon once said, it seems like I've been quoting Charles Spurgeon a lot lately, but there's a lot to quote. Charles Spurgeon once said this, he says, laugh at religion now, scoff at Christ now, now that the angels are gathering for the judgment, now that the trumpet sounds exceedingly loud and long, now that the heavens are red with fire, that the great furnace of hell overlaps its boundary and is about to encircle your flames, now despise religion. Ah, no, I see you. Now your stiff knees are bending. Now your bold forehead, for the first time, is covered with hot sweat and trembling. Now your eyes, that once were full of scorn, are full of tears. You look upon him, capital H, with whom you despised, and now you're weeping over your sin. Oh, sinner, it will be too late then. There is no cutting of the stone after it gets to Jerusalem. Where you fell, there you will lie. Where judgment finds you, there eternity shall leave you. Time will be no more when judgment comes, and when time is no more, change is impossible. In eternity, there can be no change, no deliverance, no signing of acquittal. Once lost, lost forever. Once damned, damned to all eternity. If that does not get you to pay attention, you better check your pulse. I, I, that sounds funny, but I'm dead serious. Even though Daniel here has just dumped a pretty heavy thing on Belshazzar, look at how Belshazzar, Belshazzar responds. Then Belshazzar says, I have sinned against the Holy God. I for, please forgive me. I repent to dust and ashes. No! There's not a single sign of repentance here. It says, then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that now he had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So on the heels of Daniel giving this proclamation of what was going to take place to Belshazzar. Belshazzar comes to an end. The Babylonian Empire comes to an end. And now the king of the Medes and the Persians, Darius, who we're going to look at here in a couple weeks, actually no, maybe three weeks, we'll look at this in Daniel chapter 6. We'll get into probably one of the most familiar stories in all of scripture, Daniel the lion's den, we see that he takes over all of the Babylonian empire and the Medo-Persian empire becomes even greater than the Babylonian empire. All of this is an Old Testament version of the rich fool Jesus talked about in the parable that he gives in Luke 12. This is what I want to close with today. Turn to Luke chapter 12. You don't have to hold your place here in Daniel. We won't come back. Dan, or excuse me, Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge? or arbitrator over you. Then he said to them, Beware, 
and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have done many good, many, you have many goods, laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's take the story of Belshazzar here as an example to number our days. Like James chapter 1 tells us, or else God could cut our days short. Maybe as you listen to this message today, you're standing against some pretty difficult things. The odds seem to be stacked against you. And you're trying to stand for the sake of the Lord. Let's be reminded that the battle, as a believer in Jesus Christ, the battle is not yours and yours alone. The battle belongs to him. And he upholds and honors those who are his, even in the face of wicked kings. Let's pray. Lord, what an encouragement it is for us to be reminded that you battle for us. When we walk in obedience to your will and face the opposition that we face, you fight for us. We are entering a time in our lives where it looks like we as believers, that that's going to become a very real thing to us. Facing opposition. But I pray today's example, and the example we've seen all throughout Scripture of how you are sovereign over all, is an encouragement and a reminder to us that when we read the Revelation, we see we rule and reign with Jesus forever and ever in an eternity and in a kingdom that never ends, and that will never be corrupted. Because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is the one who rules it all. What an encouragement that that is to us. So I pray as we leave here today, Lord, that you will set our eyes on you, no matter what it is that we may be facing, no matter what it is that, we, that may be heavy on our heart, no matter how bleak an outlook may be that we have, Remind us that you reign supreme. And may you be glorified now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to close today, if you'd please stand and turn in your hymnals to hymn number 446. I'd rather have Jesus. We'll sing all the verses here for this closing hymn. Hymn number 446. I'd rather have Jesus.
my prayer for us. And that's my prayer as we leave here this week, and not just this week, but every day of our lives, that we'd rather have Jesus than anything else. God bless you. Have a good week.